afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my library. I'm Eric Wittenberg. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a presentation today on one of my favorite campaigns of the American Civil War, William Tecumseh Sherman's Carolinas campaign that began on January the 29th, 1865, ended right after the Battle of Bentonville on March the 22nd. But we're also going to address the, uh, the final campaign of the war that led to the surrender of Joseph Johnston's army at Bennett Place near Durham Station, North Carolina on April the 26th, 1865. So that's an overview of what we're covering today. Uh, I am aware that many people have very little in the way of substantive knowledge about this particular campaign. Just by way of background, it's a campaign that I've been studying pretty intensively since about the year 2000. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have a battlefield tour of the Bentonville battlefield directly from Mark Bradley in 2002. And uh, that's what really got me started studying this campaign in depth. I have subsequently done a fair amount of research and writing on it of my own. I have two books on two different cavalry uh, engagements that we'll talk about today. Uh, that have been published. So th this is a campaign that I have long been fascinated by and uh, I hope you enjoy. This is William Tecumseh Sherman, born and raised in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, in the winter of 1865, he was 45 years old. He's a West Point trained soldier. His brother John was a United States Senator uh, from the state of Ohio. Some of you may have heard of the Sherman Antitrust Act named for his brother John, who was the author of that particular legislation. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, had a somewhat checkered career during the Civil War. He had been the commandant of what is today uh, Louisiana Technical I University, uh, Louisiana Tech, which at the time was a military school. So he had a great understanding and appreciation for the people of the South, and he understood uh, what they were trying to accomplish. And he also came to the realization that he was a man who was going to have to uh, impose his will and break the will of the South if the North was going to win. In the spring of 1864, he became the commander of, of all the Union armies attached to the Western Theater. Uh, he was Ulysses Grant's friend and right hand. Uh, Sherman apparently had something of a nervous breakdown early in the war, and uh, Grant stood by him, and, and Sherman famously said, Grant stood by me when I was crazy, and I stood by him when he was drunk. Today, now we stand by each other. Uh, he had very much had Grant's trust. He had Grant's appreciation. Sherman was a brilliant strategist and a not particularly good battlefield tactical commander, but when it came to developing grand strategy, there, there was probably no equivalent to him uh, in the Union armies, and he had a great deal of success in developing strategy, first to capture Atlanta, and then after the fall of Atlanta, uh, he will march his army across the state of Georgia from Atlanta to Savannah. Savannah surrendered to him on the 24th of December of 1864, Grant then, or Sher excuse me, Sherman then sent a, a telegram to the White House uh, making a gift of the city of Savannah to Abraham Lincoln. So his army settled down in Savannah after capturing it. He, he needed to resupply and refit. And at that point, Grant really believed that the South had been largely eviscerated by Sherman's army. And he didn't think that there was any substantial uh, resistance left in in the deep south and he wanted Sherman to embark his army on boats and bring it to the Petersburg area to join the army of the Potomac which would have uh, when you had the army of the Potomac the army of the James and then Sherman's 60,000 men you would have had something in the range of 200,000 soldiers against uh, a rapidly decreasing Confederate army you can understand why Grant wanted it Sherman, however, resisted the idea. Sherman rather preferred to march his army across South Carolina and across North Carolina and then on up to Petersburg to join Grant. Along the way, he would crush Southern morale, crush Southern resistance, and hopefully bring an expedited end to the, to the South by removing 
the Deep South from the equation. It took some persuasion, but he finally persuaded Grant that the idea had merit and Grant finally granted permission. So Sherman then spent the next several weeks preparing his, his command to march. He actually has with him two different army groups divided into two wings. You had the Army of the Tennessee, formerly Grant's command, then Sherman's command, now commanded by uh, West Point trained Oliver Otis Howard, the former commander of the 11th Corps of the Army of the Potomac, a one-armed general who I often refer to as Uh-O Howard. Uh, he is living, breathing proof of the truth of the Peter Principle, that in every hierarchy, each member will rise to his own level of incompetence and remain there. But uh, being a West Pointer, he had the confidence of, of both Grant and Sherman. Uh, this is the army that, of course, has won at Shiloh, has won at Chattanooga. Uh, it is a fine army. It has also been victorious in the Atlanta campaign. The other army, commanded by Major General Henry Warner Slocum of New York, was the Army of Georgia. Now, this was a, an amalgamation of commands. It was formerly called the Army of, of the Ohio. Uh, as it made its way to Atlanta, it's been reconstituted, consists in part of, of the old 20th Corps, which is the remnants of the 11th and 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. And uh, Henry Slocum was the commander of the 12th Corps of the Army of the Potomac. So it's interesting that the two Army commanders in, in Sherman's Army group uh, were both refugees from the Army of the Potomac, and not, neither of them had their roots in the Western theater. So the combined force was approximately 60,000 men, and Sherman will be preparing to march and will leave his positions around Savannah on January 29th, 1865. Facing the, those soldiers was a small collection, and it was a ragtag hodgepodge collection of men, commanded by Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard, the uh, Creole from New Orleans, uh, West Point trained. Uh, Beauregard was in his mid fifties at this point. He was a fellow who was notorious for being both a brilliant general, but also for being high strung. And that that high strung nature of his caused him to have uh, periodic breakdowns of his health. Uh, he and Confederate President Jefferson Davis did not get along. They couldn't stand each other. That added friction to the relationship, but Beauregard at the time was based in Charleston. His command consists of approximately 19,000 men. Uh, this includes some remnants of the Army of Tennessee, which has been shifted to the uh, south, Southeastern Theater uh, in South Carolina and Georgia after its massive defeat at the Battle of Nashville in November of 1864. It also consists of about 6,500 men from the defenses of Charleston, mostly heavy artillerists. They've now been converted into infantry, although they still wear their red artillery uniforms, so they become known as the Red Infantry. Obviously, there is a, a, much, a great disparity in force. The other thing that, that Beauregard had was the roughly 4,000 men of Joseph Wheeler's Cavalry Corps. Uh, commanding troops under Beauregard is Major General Lafayette McClaws of Georgia, formerly a division commander in Longstreet's Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. He has been assigned the most difficult task uh, at the beginning of this campaign. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, a geography lesson about the state of South Carolina, if you look at a map of South Carolina, there are highlands in the northwest, there are low, there's a lot of low country along the ocean, and some intermediate ground in between. It's more or less shaped like a lopsided triangle. And there are a number of rivers that run diagonally across that lopsided triangle from northwest to southeast. And there are a series of them. And each one of those rivers will become a substantial hurdle that will have to be crossed in order to make their, the Army's way across South Carolina. The first of these is the Salkahatchee River. The Salkahatchee River is the, the southeasternmost of, of the rivers. Uh, it is also the one that is swampiest. The river itself, as you'll see in a moment, isn't very wide, but what it is is a massive swamp, and the swamp extends in places more than a mile wide. So that means that 
these troops are going to have to wade their way through swamps that are filled with alligators, that are filled with snakes, that are filled with all sorts of, of nasty critters. And the only thing that's, that's good for them is that this campaign is going to take place in winter when it's still cold, and that these cold-blooded reptiles are not necessarily going to be terribly active. Otherwise, it could, be, could have been a real problem. So the idea was that McClaws, with roughly 2,000 men, would defend the line of the Salkahatchee River. And hopefully, that line of the Salkahatchee River would be a sufficient enough barrier to hold Sherman back. There are only three bridges that were pertinent to the uh, crossing. They were uh, Rivers Bridge, Buford's Bridge, and uh, Bottoms Bridge. And those bridges were all defended, which means that either Sherman was going to have to force his way across one of those bridges, or alternatively, he was going to have to wade the swamps. Now he will have with him a large force of engineers and pioneers. The, uh, these engineers and pioneers will do spectacular work for him. As he makes his way across South Carolina, these men will be cutting down trees and building corduroy roads as they go, and doing so at a remarkably fast pace. The accomplishment of these men was such that after the end of the campaign, when Sherman was speaking to Joe Johnston about the uh, surrender of his forces, Johnston made a comment to Sherman that there had been no such army since the days of Julius Caesar and was specifically referring to the army of Hannibal that had to cross the Alps on, on elephants and everything else. This is the comparison that Sherman drew excuse me, that Johnston drew uh, with Sherman's army. And the work that they will do is nothing short of spectacular. Now, the Grand Army marches on the 29th, and by February the 1st, they have reached the line of the Sockahatchee River. This is a modern day bridge, a view of it, but you can see the three different bridges. Here, there are, there are three different bridges that were going to have to be crossed or attempted to be crossed in order to get across the line of the Salkahatchee River, which is quite a wide swamp, as you can see depicted there. At Rivers Bridge, there was a fort. There was also a significant fort at one of the other crossings. Buford's Bridge, the western, northwesternmost one of the three, was a bridge that was very difficult to defend simply because it was really deep in the swamps. You also see on the map here the town of Barnwell. Barnwell will become significant as we advance. So with the men of the 17th Corps of the Army of Ten the Tennessee under command of Jefferson C. Davis, uh, these soldiers are going to attempt first to assault uh, the, the blind of the, the Salkahatchee at the southernmost bridge. They will be repulsed there by large Confederate forces uh, armed with artillery. And this is actually what the Salkahatchee River looks like at Rivers Bridge. You can see that the channel of the river itself is not terribly wide, but that swamp extends for more than a mile. I took this photograph in November when I visited. You can see the causeway of the road that came across the bridge right in the center of the photograph on the other side uh, of the river channel. And you can also see the, the other side of, of it uh, at the bottom left-hand corner of this photograph. The river's not terribly deep. It's probably only about waist deep, but like I said, this swamp extends for well over a mile on in the distance on the other side there. So that causeway was really the only way to get through it, and you can see that it's quite narrow. It's probably just about wide enough to carry a column of four and nothing else. So after the repulse uh, at Bottoms Bridge, they, then the Union forces will have to make an assault at Rivers Bridge. And they will do so having to pass through the swamp. This is a depiction of Sherman's, Sherman's soldiers, his army passing through the swamps of South Carolina. You can get a sense of what this would have been like and what it looked like and felt like to these men. He's going to end up having his men make a flanking move on Rivers Bridge through the swamp to actually attack it from the flanks and flank the Confederates under McClaws out of their position 
at Rivers Bridge on the 3rd of February, 1865. And they will drive the Confederate troops away, meaning that Sherman has breached the line of the Salkahatchee. This is a big problem for Beauregard because he really had staked a lot on the ability to defend the line of the Salkahatchee, and Sherman broke right through it in two days. In addition, we've got this cavalry force under command of Joe Wheeler. Wheeler was uh, a little guy. He was maybe five foot four, 130 pounds dripping wet in a rock with, his, with a rock in his pocket. He was quite young. Uh, consequently, the men of his command named him the war child. They also called him Fighting Joe. Wheeler was a good fighter and a brave man. There is no question about either of those things but he was also an absolutely horrendous disciplinarian. His command was extremely undisciplined. Uh, and as Sherman's army made its way across Georgia with only Wheeler's force to resist it, uh, many of the Georgia residents complained more about the depredations caused by Wheeler's cavalrymen than by Sherman's troops. They were more afraid of the hooligans of Wheeler's command than they were of Sherman's army. Now see if that makes any sense to you. Uh, that winter, Beauregard sent his nephew, it was a man named Colonel Alfred Roman, who was his inspector general, to go and inspect Wheeler's command. And, and Roman wrote a really remarkable report. And in that report, he talks about the fact that this command, while it's a hard fighting command, is terribly undisciplined, that Joe Wheeler, who is a brave and dedicated soldier, is not up to commanding a corps and recommends that for the good of the service that Wheeler be relieved of command. It really is a remarkable document. Uh, this will not occur right away. Wheeler will resist Sherman's advance, but Wheeler's going to make a critical error. Wheeler was born in Connecticut, but was raised in Augusta, Georgia, and Augusta became his adopted hometown. Augusta was a critical site for the Confederacy if for no other reason that it was the site of the Augusta Powder Works, which is where the vast majority of the gunpowder used by the Confederate Army in the second half of the war was manufactured. Sherman, as part of his plan, is going to do his level best to confuse Beauregard as to what his intentions are. He will cross the, the line of the Saukahatchee and make a feint in the direction of Charleston. But Sherman believed that Charleston had no strategic value to speak of, and that if he bypassed Charleston, he would flank the soldiers out of it, and that's exactly what will happen. Instead, he's going to head in the direction of Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, which is to the north and west of Charleston. He has operating with him the, the cavalry division commanded by Brevet Major General Hugh Judson Kilpatrick. Uh, Judson Kilpatrick is uh, yet another retread from the Army of the Potomac. He has formerly been the third division commander of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry Corps. Uh, in the spring of 1864, Sherman specifically requested Kilpatrick and, and made a, a famous comment where he said, I know Kilpatrick's a hell of a damned fool, but he's exactly the kind of fool I want to lead my cavalry on this expedition, meaning the expedition to uh, attempt to capture Atlanta that ultimately succeeded in September of 1864. Along the way, Kilpatrick will have his own travails. He'll uh, be wounded in battle. He'll be nearly captured at one point during the Atlanta campaign. He has with him three brigades of cavalry, numbering roughly 3,000 men. The problem is, is that they're living off the land and horses being the fragile beasts that they are, will break down if they're not properly fed and not given adequate rest. And his command's horses will suffer greatly. And because the, the unit was on the move at all times and Sherman is living off the supplies he has with him and the supplies and, that he can gather from the countryside, it's very difficult to replace these horses. So he's going to end up with a fourth brigade as part of Kilpatrick's command which is sort of a provisional ad hoc brigade commanded by a fellow named Major William Way, W-A-Y, of the 9th Michigan Cavalry that consists of the dismounted men. We're going to end up trying to keep up with the cavalry by marching on foot. So we have three brigades of mounted cavalry and one brigade of dismounted cavalry. 
and a six, uh, uh, excuse me, a four gun battery of horse artillery, uh, the 10th Wisconsin Battery. Uh, and that is the command that will accompany Sherman on this expedition. He places Kilpatrick on his left flank and has him operating on his left flank. And at one point, they're going to instruct Kilpatrick to make a feint in the direction of Augusta. Now, there are Confederate troops in Augusta, commanded by Daniel, Major General Daniel Harvey Hill, yet another former commander of a division from the Army of Northern Virginia. And there are also elements of the Army of Tennessee that are arriving there under command of Brigadier General, uh, actually, I think it was Major General Carter Stevenson. Well, when Wheeler sees this force is headed in the direction of Augusta, he ends up disobeying his express orders. His express orders are to man the line of the next river defense position in South Carolina. And instead, Wheeler will disobey his orders and head in the direction of Augusta uh, in an attempt to try and defend his hometown, which is interesting because Sherman had absolutely no intention of trying to capture Augusta. It was just a feint, and Wheeler bit at the bait. And consequently, Wheeler will end up laying a trap for Kilpatrick in the town of the lovely town of Aiken, South Carolina, which even in those days was a town that was a resort town. But before Kilpatrick gets there, he will pass through the town of Barnwell. Barnwell was a town named for the Robert Barnwell, who was one of the leaders of the secession movement. So as you might imagine, the Union Cavalry had no particular fondness for Barnwell. Uh, after gathering the, the townspeople for what he said was going to be a cotillion that evening, uh, Kilpatrick's troops burned the town. And he was later heard to laugh about it, saying the town should be renamed Burnwell, as opposed to Barnwell. Uh, some of his cavalry end up stabling their horses in a church in the town. It, it was really a pretty unpleasant thing. And then after shaking loose from Barnwell, Kilpatrick is making this feint in the, in the direction of Aiken. Aiken is, as the crow flies, about 15 miles from Augusta. What he doesn't realize is, is that Wheeler, with his entire command, is across his route of march at Aiken and waiting in the form of an ambush. And you can see the map that's up on your screen. The Confederates are deployed in a U-shaped formation that blocks Kilpatrick's route through the town. He has with him a single brigade uh, of cavalry commanded by Brigadier General Smith Atkins that consists of the 9th Michigan Cavalry, the 9th Ohio Cavalry, the 10th Ohio Cavalry, and the 92nd Illinois Mounted Infantry, uh, which had been previously part of, of John T. Wilder's famous Lightning Brigade, as well as a two-gun section of the 10th Wisconsin Battery. And with Kilpatrick at the head, blithely riding along without any scouts out in front of him, he rides right into Wheeler's trap, Wheeler springs his trap. Kilpatrick is nearly captured. Much of the 9th Michigan and 92nd Illinois are nearly captured. Fortunately, the 92nd Illinois is armed entirely with Spencers, and that Spencer rifle allowed them to lay down such a heavy fire that they were able to fight their way back out of the trap. This was the last battlefield victory for the Confederates in that theater of the war. That's hard to imagine. This occurred on the 11th of February, 1865. Kilpatrick will then have to fight a, a fighting retreat back to uh, where he had left his other two brigades, which were waiting for him there, actually the other three, because the dismounted men were there too. And uh, Wheeler will pursue him for a while, see that he's got a large force of dug in Union cavalry in front of him, and will eventually break off and withdraw. But that fighting retreat back to a place called uh, Johnson's Turnout on the Carolina Railroad uh, will last about five miles. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a monument in the town of Aiken that uh, is to the battle that was fought there. <coughs> Excuse me. As you can see, it is a handsome monument. It's not easy to find. There are a, a number of Union battle dead that are buried there, but Aiken is the last battlefield commander or uh, victory for that Confederate cavalry. 
Kilpatrick will then change directions. They will force their way across the next river and head directly for the capital of South Carolina, Columbia. On your screen is a photograph of Wade Hampton III, who was born and raised in Columbia. He was reputedly the wealthiest man in the South before the war, having paid for, raised and paid for the equipping of the Hampton Legion, which was six companies of infantry, four companies of cavalry, and a four-gun battery of artillery. Uh, that cavalry will become the nucleus of what is later redesignated the Second South Carolina Cavalry, and the battery will become Captain James Hart's battery of horse artillery that serves with the Army of Northern Virginia. In the summer of 1864, after the death of, Wade, of uh, Jeb Stuart, Wade Hampton becomes the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia's Cavalry Corps. He has no formal military training, but he is a hard fighter. He is an extremely reliable officer, 6'4", 240 pounds of solid muscle. As a young man, Wade Hampton was most proud of the fact that at the age of 17, he killed a bear with his own bare hands. He killed 13 Yankees in combat during the course of the war in hand-to-hand -hand combat, was wounded multiple times, and he's an angry man. He's an angry man for a lot of reasons. He's an angry man because his brother Frank, the Lieutenant Colonel of the 2nd South Carolina Cavalry, has been mortally wounded in combat at Brandy Station on June 9, 1863. His son Preston has been killed in combat. I'm sorry, his son Wade Jr. was killed in combat. Wade IV was killed in combat. And his son Preston was wounded while trying to receive or retrieve Wade's body. He'd lost everything and was about to lose more. But Wade Hampton had requested leave from the Army of Northern Virginia to go and defend his home state of South Carolina. And because things were quiescent along the front lines at Petersburg, Robert E. Lee reluctantly agreed to allow Hampton to depart, taking with him his former division, now commanded by Hampton's protege, Major General Matthew Calbraith Butler, uh, who uh, will bring with him two good veteran, three good veteran brigades, two, excuse me, two good veteran brigades of cavalry to add to the, the force of Confederate cavalry that's already operating there. Problem is, is that Joe Wheeler outranked Hampton. His promotion and commission as Major General was prior to Hampton's, which means he was senior to Hampton, which means he commit with, technically was senior to Hampton's command as well. And Hampton, under no uncertain circumstances, was willing to serve under Joe Wheeler's command. He made it abundantly clear that he would not take orders from Wheeler, that he would not serve under Wheeler's command. So they fixed it the only way they could. They promoted Hampton to Lieutenant General, which became effective on February 12, 1865, the day after the Battle of Aiken. And to Joe Wheeler's credit, he took it well. He was good natured about it. He, he offered his services and agreed to serve under Hampton's command. So Hampton and his troopers are in the town of Columbia, South Carolina. There are two significant rivers that pass through Columbia, the Congaree River being one and the Broad River being the other. They have a confluence there. Columbia is a place that Sherman wants to punish because it is in Columbia that the secession convention was held and where the ordinance of secession was passed in 1861. So when Sherman has the opportunity to advance on, on Columbia, his troops will set a massive fire in the town on February 17th that will burn much of downtown Columbia. And then just to seed sows, uh, sow seeds of discontent, uh, Sherman will blame Wade Hampton's soldiers for setting the fire. Part of what burned was Hampton's home, Millwood Plantation. What you see in this photograph is all that's left of Millwood Plantation, the columns out front. I took this photograph in November. Uh, it is a lovely site. The Hampton family still owns it. There are two large houses on the property today. They are direct linear descendants of Wade Hamptons, but that's all that's left of Millwood Plantation. So when Millwood Plantation was burned down, Hampton had literally lost everything that he had, and he was an angry man. And when William Tecumseh Sherman blamed him for the burning of Columbia. He became even angrier. It was obviously not true. 
history has borne that out that it wasn't true. But Hampton was as angry as a wet hen, as my mother liked to say about it, and, and rightfully so. Sherman will rest in, in Columbia for a few days and then will push on. Now he's headed for the northeastern part of South Carolina to cross the Great PD River and cross into North Carolina. The last town, and you see the PD River on the map here, is a lovely little town called Shira. Shira is uh, in the northeastern corner of South Carolina. It was defended by Matthew Calbraith Butler's cavalry and also by some infantry of the 1st Georgia Regulars. Uh, Major General Joseph Mauer's division of the 17th Corps will push its way into Shira, will push the Confederates back across the bridge. Uh, they'll take position on the bluffs on the opposite side of the Great PD River. In the meantime, Sherman will burn the railroad depot, and you can see that there is in the uh, south of the railroad depot, there's a big X there. That big X was the sign of, of a powder magazine that will get set up to explode and it will cause a massive explosion. The Confederates are driven back across, they burned the river across the Great PD, or the bridge across the Great PD River, meaning that Sherman's engineers have to build a pontoon. It will slow them up just a little bit, but they'll force their way across the Great PD River there and at a place called the Grassy Islands. Uh, Joe Wheeler will have to make his escape at the Grassy Islands and they fall back into North Carolina. The passage through the state of South Carolina has taken four weeks. It has covered a little over 200 miles. There have been several engagements fought, but more importantly, Sherman's army has had to build its roads as it went. It is truly a logistical miracle that they accomplished what they accomplished. Now, where's Sherman headed next? There is an important railroad depot at a place called Goldsboro, North Carolina, that is north and east of the state capital at Raleigh. A railroad from the coast has been built there and it intersects with some of the railroads uh, that are used to supply the Union Army. And this is going to be Sherman's destination. It's another roughly 200 miles away. Uh, he is going to march his army there where it will rest and refit before supposedly marching on to join Grant in the trenches around Petersburg. So they've got another 200 and some miles yet to go. This will show you what the advance across uh, South Carolina looks, uh, North Carolina looks like. They will pass through Shira. They will pass across the Great PD River. They will then head from the Great PD River to a detachment of, of Kilpatrick's cavalry. Will first visit Wadesboro and then Rockingham, while the on, on still operating on the left flank, while the main body heads for. Fayetteville and the Cape Fear River. <clears throat> Fayetteville is the fall line for the Cape Fear River, which means that supplies can be floated up the river from Wilmington. Wilmington has fallen, <coughs> excuse me, in late January of 1865, meaning that the PD River is now available. There's also a bridge across the, uh, P, the uh, excuse me, the Cape Fear River in Fayetteville. It's called the Clarendon Bridge. And uh, if that can be captured intact, it will greatly expedite the crossing of the river. In the meantime, the Confederates are chasing after the Confederate, excuse me, the Union troops are chasing after retreating Confederate forces, the largest piece of which is uh, a command under William J. Hardee that consists of the troops that have been evacuated first from Savannah and then later from Charleston. <coughs> the, excuse me, the so-called Red Infantry that I described to you earlier. They're trying to catch up to them. It's a race. Hampton is going to do what he can to resist the advance of Kilpatrick's cavalry. There will be some skirmishing at Wadesboro. There'll be some skirmishing at Rockingham. Kilpatrick will reach a place called Solemn Grove, which you can see on your map, uh, on the night of, of March 8th, and they will spend the night on of March 8th uh, at Solemn Grove before moving on. Now, at the same time, and it's not depicted on the map, but you see the town of Kinston on the map. You can see that Kinston 
is on a, on the railroad line that ultimately ends up going to Goldsboro. A large Union force commanded by Major General uh, John M. Schofield uh, is gathering in, in Goldsboro. Part of that is a detachment under Union Salt Commander Major General uh, uh, ba -ba -ba, lost his name for a moment there. Forgive me. Commanded the Ninth Corps at Antietam. Well, we'll come back. And in, in any event, a, a scratch force of Union soldiers under command of General Braxton Bragg will attack these Confederate or these Union soldiers at Kinston at a place called Wise's Fork in a three day battle, the 8th, 9th, and 10th of March at Wise's Fork. Ultimately, the Union soldiers uh, will drive off Bragg's command and will then advance onto Goldsboro to make the preparation for the arrival of Sherman's army. In the meantime, Kilpatrick marches again on the morning of March the 9th, and he will reach a place called Monroe's Crossroads on the evening of March the 9th. They're at this point only four or five miles behind Hardee's column. Uh, Kilpatrick will, will do something that is really kind of inconceivable. He will establish his camp, and he's got one, two, he's got one mounted brigade, the brigade of uh, George E. Spencer, uh, and, and this is Lieutenant General William J. Hardee, old reliable, the commander of the Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. It's his troops that are being pursued. Anyway, he'll have the, the brigade of George Spencer, and he'll have the dismount brigade with him. He's going to establish his headquarters at the, the Monroe, Charles Monroe House. He's going to put some pickets out on the Morganton Road, but it's only one company of the 5th Kentucky Cavalry, and uh, that's all he's going to put out. As you can see, all of Wade Hampton's cavalry, his division, <coughs> the two brigades of uh, Colonel Gilbert Young and Brigadier General Evander Law, yet another uh, refugee from the Army of, of Northern Virginia, and all of Wheeler's brigade are going to form an L-shaped position. They're going to capture that single company of cavalry, meaning that there's nobody to put up the alarm. And because Kilpatrick doesn't have scouts out, Hampton will make his dispositions knowing that he's operating out there with nobody to stop him. The plan is Law and Young will attack from the north. Wheeler's Corps will attack along Nichols, Nicholson Creek, which unfortunately was a thick, Im, almost impenetrable swamp because it was a very rainy time and that area is filled with water and the, the attack will bog down there. Because of that, Wheeler asked for permission to attack dismounted and Hampton said no, he wanted this to be a, a mounted attack. So that's exactly what will be planned. And you can see that the two full divisions of Confederate cavalry under Wheeler are getting ready to attack through the swamp. Butler will go to an officer of Gilbert Young's brigade and specifically of the Cobb Legion cavalry and give this officer the task of capturing Judson Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick has established his headquarters in the Monroe House. Colonel Spencer is also, has his headquarters there as does Lieutenant Colonel Way and as does Kilpatrick's traveling companion, an unidentified female known to history only as Alice, who was uh, trying to make her way back north from the deep south and was uh, apparently paying her way by providing certain services to General Kilpatrick. And uh, they were in the upstairs bedroom of the house. And when the attack kicked off at dawn and it kicked off with absolute surprise, Kilpatrick was awakened by the commotion. And he came out on the front porch what was to see what was going on. And this officer of the Cobb Legion Cavalry had been assigned the task of capturing him, spotted Kilpatrick on, on the porch, dressed only in his nightshirt, and said, where's General Kilpatrick? And Kilpatrick had enough of his wits about himself to point at a Union officer who was escaping on a horse and saying, that's him right there. So the Confederate cavalry pursued this officer and Kilpatrick went back in the house 
And Alice, of all people, made a stout stand persuading the Confederates there were nothing but civilians in the house and persuading them to post guards. Kilpatrick, Way, and Spencer ultimately escaped to the swamp. Uh, the Confederate attack bogs down in the swamp with heavy losses. Uh, the several brigade commanders, one of the division commanders of Wheeler's Corps are killed or wounded in this attack because they have to force their way through the swamp. In the meantime, Kilpatrick's men fall back on the other side of Nicholson Creek where he rallies them and ultimately begins to lead a counterattack that will drive back the Confederate cavalry. In the meantime, Kilpatrick has sent for help and a division of infantry, uh, Morgan's division of the 14th Corps, marches to come to his assistance. Now keep in mind, Kilpatrick is fighting a battle, a desperate battle for his survival, but Wade Hampton's objective here is not to necessarily win the battle or even to inflict casualties. Those are all good things if he can make them happen, but that's not what he's trying to do. He's trying to keep that Union cavalry tied up to buy time for Hardee's Corps to make its way to Fayetteville to get across that Clarendon Bridge and then to destroy it. So as Kilpatrick rallies his troops and begins to lead a counterattack out of the swamp, uh, they recapture their guns under Lieutenant Ebenezer Stetson. They open fire on the Confederates. They inflict more casualties. Eventually, when Hampton learns that there is infantry coming to reinforce Kilpatrick, he elects to break off and withdraw, leaving the brigade of Brigadier General George Dibral to serve as his rear brigade, as his rear guard, and they fight a rear guard action until the rest of the Confederate cavalry is able to successfully withdraw. And then Dibral withdraws as well, and Kilpatrick is perfectly happy to let them go, meaning that an entire day is lost by virtue of this attack, which in turn did in fact allow Hardy to get his troops across the uh, Cape Fear River at Fayetteville. When Mitchell's troops arrive uh, at, on the battlefield and hear what happened, they begin calling what happened to Judson Kilpatrick laughingly described as Kilpatrick's shirt tail skedaddle. And that's exactly what it was. Monroe's Crossroads is an interesting battle to study for a lot of regions. The reasons it, it proves the old cliche that the terrain drives the action. In this instance, the terrain absolutely dictated the action, the swamp in particular. And because of the lay of the land, it funneled everybody down into, down into the swamp. In addition, these hungry Confederates command control broke down very quickly because these troopers couldn't resist the opportunity to plunder the Union camps of food and stop and eat, and all control broke down very quickly. It became more or less a mob situation, but it, made, it, it accomplished its goal. The goal was to prevent Kilpatrick from cutting off Hardee's infantry, and it kept them in place for an entire day. So when they finally march the next day, they head for Fayetteville, and they make their way to Fayetteville. There is a, a skirmish in the streets of the town uh, Hampton engages with some Union troops uh, personally, and the, the rear guard, which had consists of Hampton, some of Butler's guys and some of Wheeler's guys, make their way across the bridge across the Cape Fear River, and they set it ablaze. It burns, collapses into the river, and Sherman then has to wait there for several days until pontoon equipment is floated up the river from Wilmington. This in turn allows Hardy to fall back to a position near a place called Dunn, North Carolina, uh, where he will turn and the, the advance of the Union troops. Uh, he is ultimately trying to make his way to the town of Smithfield, where Joseph Johnston, who's been called out of retirement at the age of 58 and given command of all the troops in the theater, uh, is trying to cobble together an army. On your screen now is Major General Alpheus Old Pap Williams, the uh, temporary commander of the 20th Corps, formerly a, a, an officer of the 12th Corps, the Army of the Potomac. Old Pap Williams had no military training, but he was a natural soldier and was very accomplished, very successful. And he will lead Sherman's advance and specifically the advance of Slocum's command as it makes its way 
toward Dunn pursuing after Hardy. Hardy has constructed an interesting defensive scheme at a place called Aversboro near Dunn. He has constructed a defense in depth designed after and take, modeled very closely after the defense in depth that was fought by uh, Daniel Morgan's Revolutionary War soldiers at the 1781 Battle of Calpins. Going to use pre-planned, pre-established defensive positions for the purpose of, of delaying the advance of the enemy until they're driven back and ultimately they're going to fall from back from one position to a second to a third. The third position being the strongest, it was anchored on both flanks on rivers. On the left flank, it was anchored, excuse me, on its right, it was anchored on the Cape Fear. On its left, it was anchored by the Black River, meaning that it could not be flanked out of position. The first two positions could, the third one couldn't. And it'll lead to a full day battle. Hardy with roughly 8,000 men up against fully half of Sherman's army, 30,000 men and Hardy will make a stand for an entire day. Why? Because he has designed and conducted this absolutely brilliant defense in depth. The first Confederate line falls. Uh, Colonel Alfred Red, who's the commander of the brigade, uh, ends up being captured. Uh, the Union troops push on. They attack the second line. The second line holds for a while before it ultimately is broken. And by the time it breaks, Late in the afternoon of, of March 16th, Sherman sees this stout Confederate defensive position awaiting him, a third one, manned by Hardy's entire force, and he decides he wants no part of it. He decides he's going to stop, he's going to halt for the night, he's going to uh, consolidate his position, he's going to redress his lines, and he's going to assault it in the morning. That halt proved fatal because that night, Hardy's troops silently left their entrenched positions and withdrew, made their way safely to Smithfield where they joined up with Joe Johnston and his command. And in the morning when Sherman advanced, uh, went to attack Hardy's position, they found the, the trench line empty. This is the most Brilliant example of a defense in depth of all of the American Civil War. And as you can see, it was extremely effective. It's also a good example of how Sherman was not the greatest battlefield commander. By the way, during this, Kilpatrick rides over to Sherman and asks for orders. Sherman looks at him like he's insane and says to Kilpatrick, you know what to do. And from that moment forward, Sherman appears to have lost whatever faith he had in his cavalry commander because Kilpatrick and his cavalry play very little role in these proceedings for the rest of the campaign. Joe Johnston, 58 years old, had been a brigadier general in the Union Army or in the United States Army before the war. He is one of the four highest ranking officers in all of the Confederate Army. He's the original commander of the Army of Northern Virginia until he gets wounded. He's a brave guy. The soldiers love him. He's very cautious. He tends to be defensive in nature. And he, and if it's possible for uh, anybody to hate Jefferson Davis more or be hated more than PGD po Beauregard, it was Joe Johnston. He and Davis absolutely despised each other. And Davis, I'm sure it just absolutely stuck in his craw to have to pull Johnston uh, back into service, which he does. Johnston tries to cobble together an army, the purpose of which is first to turn on Sherman, try to beat him on the battlefield, and then to withdraw to try and link up with Robert E. Lee's army somewhere along the North Carolina, Virginia border. He has put together a command of about 19,000 men once Hardee's command arrives, and implementing a brilliant battle plan developed by Wade Hampton Hard, Johnston, rather than being the cautious retreating type that he's been to date, will act in a very out of character fashion. And on March 19th, will attack Williams's 20th Corps and the 14th Corps of Slocum's Army of Virginia of uh, Georgia at a place called Bentonville near uh, uh, Prairie Grove, North uh, Carolina. 
it will be a, excuse me, Oak Grove. <coughs> it will be a, a three-day battle that will take place. And on the first day, Johnston, having caught the Union Army by surprise, uh, nearly defeats Slocum in detail. <coughs> there will be a full day of heavy fighting. Eventually, the numbers will, will come to weigh. You'll see here that Bragg's command, which has joined uh, Johnston's command from Wise's Fork, uh, will attack, and as will the pathetic remnant of 4,000 men of the Army of Tennessee, who will make their last charge uh, at the Battle of Bentonville with uh, corps the size of regiments, brigades the size of, uh, or excuse me, corps the size of regiments, uh, of brigades, brigades the size of regiments, and regiments the size of companies. 4,000 men, that's all that's left. And they'll make their last attack there. At the end of the day, uh, Slocum's command holds its position, and Hardy and Stewart are forced to withdraw and pull back, meaning that uh, Sherman has not only withstood the storm, but he's also called for O.O. Howard and the right wing of the army to join him. And Howard and his army of Tennessee will arrive on day two, March 19th, which means that there are now 19,000 approximately Confederates being faced by Sherman Empire Command, 60,000 men. And you'll see that the Confederates will withdraw back into a tight defensive position. There'll be some fighting on the, sec on the 20th of, of uh, March, but not a great deal. It's more of a day of jockeying for position and the uh, army of uh, the Tennessee arriving. On March 21st, this man, Major General Joe Maurer, commands first division of 17th Corps, <clears throat> will ask for permission to make a probe against the Confederate lines. And he'll be given permission to do that by O.O. Howard. But what ha Maurer actually does, instead of making a probe, is an all out assault. And that all out assault will end up breaking Johnston's line. Johnston himself will nearly be captured. Uh, Hardy will see something horrifying. Right in front of him, a charge is made by Confederate cavalry, the 8th Texas cavalry, Texas Terry's, or Terry's Texas Rangers, uh, in a Napoleonic charge attempting to break the momentum of the Union charge. And one of the, the soldiers who is riding with the 8th Tennessee, or the 8th Texas that day, is Hardy's 16-year-old son, Willie, who Hardy has just a couple of days before finally given permission to join the army, and Willie is killed right in front of him. Uh, the general sees his son get shot down, mortally wounded, and he dies shortly thereafter. He is ultimately buried in Hillsboro, North Carolina. The Confederates barely escape. Sherman doesn't make any particular effort to pursue them. He doesn't really care too much about Johnston's army. His objective is to continue the march and get to Goldsboro and resupply. So the army under Johnston escapes to Raleigh and Sherman instead heads to Goldsboro and arrives there a couple of days later. This is a monument on the battlefield at Bentonville uh, to the Goldsboro rifles. You can see behind it a large Confederate mass grave. Most of those soldiers are unknown. There are some stones there, but the vast majority of the Confederate casualties there uh, are unidentified. So after arriving at Goldsboro and now joining with the army under Schofield that's waiting there, Sherman's now got close to 90,000 men. And he will march in early April after having taken a couple of weeks to refit. And as they march and head in the direction of Raleigh, when they get to the outskirts of Raleigh, there's a final skirmish there, a couple of skirmishes there on the 12th. And as Sherman is advancing to Raleigh, which is taken on the 13th, he learns of the surrender of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia that has taken place at Appomattox Courthouse on the 9th of, of April. He now realizes that the end is near. Johnston also learns of the surrender. He recognizes also now that the jig is up, that there's now no reason to continue hostilities. He and Beauregard are called to consult uh, with 
Jefferson Davis. They arrive at Davis's temporary capital. And along with the other members of the Confederate cabinet, uh, Davis and Beauregard explain that th there's no reason to continue hostilities, that he want, that the only course remaining now is to seek terms to end the war. Davis gives Johnston permission to meet with Sherman to have that conversation. They agree to meet on the 16th of April at the Bennett Place, a, a stop along the railroad there, uh, a few miles from Durham Station. Sherman gets on a train at Raleigh, and when he gets, just before he gets on the train, a telegraph officer stops him and hands him a telegram. Sherman reads it, folds it, put it in, puts it in his pocket, and doesn't say a word to anyone. It is the telegram advising him of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln the night before. Sherman didn't mentions it to nobody. When he gets to the Bennett Place, which is this family homestead you see depicted here in this woodcut from Harper's Weekly, uh, and he meets up with Johnston, the two men go into the, the Bennett house and Sherman hands Johnston the telegram and Johnston reads it and is absolutely horrified. He breaks out into a cold sweat. He says to Sherman, we had nothing to do with it. Sherman says, I know, but when word gets out that Lincoln has been assassinated, this is going to be problematic. They meet. In the meantime, accompanying him to this meeting were, were Judson Kilpatrick and some of his cavalry and Wade Hampton and some of his. And as Johnston and Sherman are meeting in the Bennett house, an argument breaks out between six foot four, 240 pound Wade Hampton and five foot three inch, 130 pound Judson Kilpatrick, uh, where they nearly come to blows. And instead Hampton suggests that they each take 1500 selected cavalrymen and have a mounted fight on the field of honor to decide the outcome of the war. Kilpatrick uh, ultimately decides this isn't the best idea, but this argument grows so loud that Sherman and Johnston have to uh, interrupt their discussions, come outside, and break them up. Johnston needs to get instructions, so they agree to meet again the next day. The next day, they meet again at the Bennett House, and uh, this time, Johnston has brought with him Major General John Cabell Breckinridge, the former Vice President of the United States, who is also the Confederate, last Confederate Secretary of War. Uh, Sherman refused to <clears throat> talk to Breckinridge in his capacity as Secretary of War, saying he had no authority to treat with him, and instead agreed that, that Breckinridge could attend uh, because he's a soldier. They share some Kentucky bourbon, much to John C. Breckinridge's delight. And then they engage in lengthy discussions. And at the end of the day, what is ultimately a peace treaty is drawn up and signed. Sherman has no authority to treat for peace. He has no authority to do anything other than to accept the surrender of Johnston's army on the same terms that Grant had given to Lee at Appomattox. So, he's got to then send back to Washington to get approval. And the radical Republicans are absolutely livid about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. They categorically re reject the deal that Sherman has made. Uh, in fact, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton uh, practically accuses Sherman of being a traitor. This is published in the newspapers. When Sherman found out about it, he was so hor horrifically offended by it, he never forgave Stanton. And in fact, uh, when they encountered each other at the, uh, the Grand Review of the Army uh, in May of 1865, Sherman visibly snubbed Stanton in front of President Andrew Johnson, Grant, and everybody else. Stanton ordered Grant to go relieve Sherman of command and to take control of the situation. Grant went, but Grant recognized that, that this was unjust, and he wasn't about to uh, 
follow those orders and harm his great friend. So instead he relates to Sherman what his orders are and stays behind and Sherman goes and they, he meets with Johnston again on April 26th. He makes Johnston understand that the only terms he can offer are the same terms that were given to Lee's army at Appomattox and Sher Johnston ultimately surrenders all of the remaining Confederate troops in the field east of the Mississippi River uh, via a, an instrument of surrender at the Bennett Place on April 26, 1865. So this is a reproduction of the Bennett House at the site. There's also the Unity Monument, where the uh, recognizing where the, the process of healing the Union finally came to pass. It's interesting to note that Lee surrendered roughly 29,000 men at Appomattox. Johnston surrendered 90,000 at Bennett Place, but yet the entire town of Appomattox Courthouse was preserved by the War Department as, as a, a shrine, whereas Bennett Place, the original house burned down. This is a reproduction of it. Uh, it's an exact reproduction, but it's a reproduction nonetheless. Uh, the site is very small. The main site is four acres. There's a heavily wooded tract of land across the road from it that's another 37. But it's a state park. It's not a national park. It's something that gets, in my opinion, overlooked. But in many ways, the events that happened at, at Bennett Place were more important than the events that happened at Appomattox Courthouse. And it all began with Sherman's march from Savannah on the 29th of January, 18. months later. That, my friends, is William Tecumseh Sherman's March Through the Carolinas and the Carolinas Campaign of 1865. I hope this has been educational for you. Uh, I hope that you will now come away with a better understanding of these events, and uh, I hope that it will even encourage some of you to want to learn more about it. It's been my pleasure and my privilege to share this time with you uh, during this, these strange times, and I hope you and your families all take good care of yourselves as we navigate these unknown waters.